Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now, on Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the stories we share. It's Oklahoma Gold. John J. Dwyer, what is this story? Gwen, I think you and I agree that one of the most remarkable phenomena of Oklahoma history is how much big important history there is, and how much of it we, nearly all of us, include myself, and I write history books about it, that we don't know and perhaps never even heard. Well, in this program, entitled Dixie Mafia Terror, and the next one, Dixie Mafia Justice, we're going to tackle one of the most important stories of 20th century Oklahoma history that hardly any of us have ever heard of. It's a story too big to even skim the surface in one show. So, yeah, we're going to have a, a two-parter here. We're going to have a cliffhanger. It involves a violent, relentless assault on the people of Oklahoma, the entire people of Oklahoma, that lasted years. If anything, some of you older listeners may catch a name or two that echo faintly familiar to you from your younger years. But I feel safe in saying to all of you who are listening, that you're in for a fresh, eye-opening, even shocking revelation of not-so-distant Oklahoma history today. It all begins way back in the early 1960s, when one of the most loathsome pestilences ever to beset Oklahoma and the South arose. It was the Dixie Mafia. So who was the Dixie Mafia? Well, they were a loose, ultra-violent confederation of traveling criminals. They crafted a playbook, however, that was unique to them and that worked for them for a long time. So what was their strategy? Well, they initially specialized in home invasion robberies. They often focused on remote locales with limited, unsophisticated law enforcement presence. The kind of places we might say lay along the back roads or out in the sticks and so forth. That playbook, however, gradually expanded to other types of robbery, drug trafficking, illegal gambling, and murder. Former OSBI director and legendary agent Dick Wilkerson, a native of Antlers, told me the Dixie Mafia was not the La Cosa Nostra, Nostra Mafia or connected with it in any way. They had no organizational structure. They knew where to find associates who could, with short notice, help execute planned and sometimes complex armed robberies. And if those guys weren't available, they knew where to get others. However, another law enforcement official said, amazingly, the Dixie Mafia does not have the finesse or diplomacy of the Cosa Nostra, the traditional mafia. They are more brutal, and they are hard to catch. Really, more brutal than the mafia? Well, that's who we're talking about here today. Another Oklahoma legend and former OSBI director, Harvey Pratt, a friend of both yours and mine, Gwen, Recall that the regular mafia did not even try to come into Oklahoma. Why? Well, Pratt said it was because of the Dixie Mafia. It wasn't worth the trouble because the Dixie Mafia was too ingrained. The regular mafia would have had to kill people and would have bought themselves a lot of trouble. That's from one of Oklahoma's greatest law enforcement agents. So I guess that gives us at least a sense of how dangerous these characters were. Retired OSBI agent and historian Dee Cordry, who also is a great historical author uh, out of Oklahoma City, he described the Dixie Mafia's innovative robbery schemes. Here's how they'd work. They would target somebody who wouldn't necessarily report having been robbed because it was often of already stolen money. They wouldn't report it to the police. Or they may have wanted in high-stakes poker or some other game for instance, in a place where it was illegal to play the game, though no one in the area worried too much about that. There would be huge amounts of money involved in these instances, too. 
The Dixie Mafia would know through other people there or nearby, through their underworld network, that the winner of the game had won $20,000 or $50,000 or $100,000 or whatever and had taken it home. Then, Cordry said, they would move in quickly, do a nighttime home invasion armed to the hilt, and take that cash, then threaten to come back and kill the owners if they talked about it. Well, since the victim typically got that money illegally anyway, they weren't real anxious to call the police. Meanwhile, law enforcement was gathering all of their information from informants, which had little access to this, so very little of it actually got reported to the police. The sophistication of the Dixie Mafia's execution exceeded that of other criminals as well. They monitored local law enforcement communications through police band radios installed in their cars. They also carried two-way walkie-talkies to communicate with each other before, during, and after crimes. And remember, this was all the way back in the 1960s and into the 1970s. Cordry cited another distinguishing characteristic of the Dixie Mafia. You better not rat on anybody or you'll pay a price. A big price, as we'll see. They were willing to go to prison if necessary rather than cooperate with the law. Indeed, exploring the casualty lists of Dixie Mafia crimes during their heyday from the mid-1960s into the 1980s reveals a startlingly high and gradually rising percentage of victims from within their own ranks. These were typically what they call rats or those who testified to law enforcement against their associates in order to lighten their own sentencing. Well, as the Dixie Mafia's brazen trail of blood and terror spread across the South in the late 60s, the first of two fateful events in Oklahoma's battle against them occurred on a lonely country road in Tennessee. Buford T. Pusser, the youngest sheriff in Tennessee history, who later attained worldwide fame through the Walking Tall series of motion pictures, by 1967 had already been wreaking havoc on the Dixie Mafia as a virtual one-man vigilante posse along the Tennessee-Mississippi state line. He killed more than one hitman sent to assassinate him, and he killed gun mall Louise Hathcock in a shootout after she fired on him. He survived seven knifings and eight shootings, including taking three bullets when bushwhacked on a remote traffic stop. Pusser's reputation grew national when he and his wife Pauline were ambushed by a carload of attackers on that early morning Tennessee country road. They killed Pauline and poured multiple rifle rounds into Pusser's face. Well, this mountain of a lawman survived and vowed to bring the murdering horde to justice. He spent the rest of his life attempting to do so. Permanently disfigured, Pusser pursued the killers across the South. Where Oklahoma comes directly back into this story is that Buford Pusser came to the Sooner State more than once to check out leads, share information, and look at suspects to see if he recognized them from the ambush car. He once showed the first and most famous Walking Tall movie based on his life to the entire Oklahoma City Police Force at the old downtown Center Theater. He then mounted the stage to discuss the ambush with his fellow lawmen. And Gwen, may I say that the drama and suspense related to the Dixie Mafia was only just beginning. And it was in Oklahoma. I can hardly wait to hear the golden nugget <laughs> about the Dixie Mafia. This is Oklahoma Gold. Stitching our past to the present? The Dixie Mafia, those traveling criminals, were in Oklahoma? John J. Dwyer, tell me more. Yes, they were, and they were getting ready to be big time in Oklahoma. Gwen, before the break, we were discussing Sheriff Buford T. Pusser's investigative efforts in several southern states, including Oklahoma, where Dixie Mafia thugs suspected of attacking him and killing his wife produced enormous unintended benefits. You see, up until that point, this is a positive out of the story, law enforcement agencies were extremely hampered in pursuing or even investigating outlaws who committed crimes in their own states beyond what happened in that state. So Oklahoma lawmen had little access to background information in other states about people who came into Oklahoma and committed crimes and then left. 
Similarly, they struggle to learn what crimes the perpetrators might have committed already in other states. In effect, Oklahoma lawmen had scattered snapshots of criminal activity, usually limited to Oklahoma, rather than a cohesive, comprehensive, and ongoing film or movie about the totality of the lawbreakers' crimes and even life. So, Pusser's efforts, along with those of Oklahoma agencies, including the Oklahoma City Police Department, the Tulsa County Sheriff's Department, and the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, brought about a much more formalized system of law enforcement exchanging information on traveling criminals such as the Dixie Mafia and keeping track of them from one city to a county to another state. And by the late 1970s or early 1980s, a governmental entity called the Regional Crime Information Center was formed. It's still in business today. They, this came all about from the pursuit of the Dixie Mafia by brave lawmen from Oklahoma and other southern states. Well, sadly, the Pusser's ambush was a dramatic, though not isolated, example of these killers' unprecedented disdain for all American institutional authority and of the danger to anyone within that constitutional structure or even the general public who dared to oppose them. Much of their most brutal violence, though, occurred, as we mentioned earlier, within their own ranks. To give you an idea of what we're dealing with here, what our lawmen were dealing with, one Dixie Mafia gunman put a bullet in the brain of a young colleague only because he feared the young man might have been recorded on a surveillance camera during a check forging episode. Then he became furious because the bullet lodged in the boy's head and thought it might connect the killer's prized new pistol, which he treasured, to the crime, then he might have to get rid of it. So he grabbed the dead victim by his hair, emptied his gun into the same wound in the head until he was satisfied all the bullets were blown out of his head. I'm sure you'd agree with me, dear listener, that not even most criminals would be crazed enough to do something that sickening. You know, may I just say there are other worse instances that I came across in my research than that. Well, one of the most notorious of all the Dixie Mafia and the only man referred to as its leader was McAllister native Kirksey Nix Jr. His handsome, charismatic father, Kirksey Sr., was one of the most powerful Oklahoma state senators of his generation and the only person ever to defeat state political legend Gene Stipe in a legislative race. That's right. Nix Sr. had numerous underworld associations while rising to the head of the Oklahoma Circuit Court of Appeals on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And by age 22 or 23, his son, Kirksey Nix Jr., was already neck deep in Dixie Mafia crime. Nix Jr. checked into a nearby motel the night before the Buford Pusser ambush. Pusser reportedly considered him a prime suspect in the attack. Nix Sr.'s Cadillac, meanwhile, was given to him by his son. It greatly resembled the vehicle described by Pusser in the attack against him and his wife. And it was parked in the judge's, the high Oklahoma judge, state capital spot on the morning of May 21, 1968, just months after the Pusser ambush, when an explosion demolished it right there in the middle of the state capital parking lot, though no one was injured. The many theories regarding the cause of that explosion have ranged from the official verdict that it was just a non-man-made chemical electrical accident to it possibly being a Dixie Mafia warning to both Nixes against ratting about the Pusser attack to vengeance from Pusser himself. Well, Gwen, today's golden nugget is that Oklahoma responded to these terrifying events by greatly elevating the quality of its law enforcement. The state changed OSBI agent appointments from state government spoils to merit, which greatly improved overall agent quality. It vastly improved their training. It cross-deputized agents with other states. And the legislature's 1967 judicial reform measures produced more competent and trustworthy courtroom judges. Every one of these was needed against the Dixie Mafia. For across the state to the northeast in the beautiful green country surrounding Tulsa, a series of other explosions accompanied a steady rise in area crime. It was here where the Dixie Mafia would unleash its greatest assault 
on the lives, liberties, and pursuit of happiness of the people of Oklahoma in the new decade of the 1970s. So that was Dixie Mafia terror. Next week, Dixie Mafia justice. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwoods, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with award-winning author and historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. Here now, on Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history through the stories we share. And these stories come from the Oklahomans Volume 2. John J. Dwyer, the Dixie Mafia? Well, Gwen, as you remember on our last program, we described the rise in the 1960s of the Dixie Mafia as a barbaric force of blood, plunder, and terror in Oklahoma and across the South. You called them traveling criminals? Traveling criminals. Very tech and comms savvy. You know, they had all the up-to-date gear, but uh, this loosely connected multi-state band of traveling criminals originally focused their efforts on robbing other criminals or winners of illicit gambling contests, mostly cases where the victims had no legal recourse because they, they themselves were breaking the law. But through the years, the Dixie Mafia's reach and aims expanded not only to the general public, but even to leaders among foundational American institutions, including in Oklahoma. The very fabric of the society was in jeopardy, and as I've researched them for Volume 2 of the Oklahomans, I don't think that's an overstatement. We also discussed last time Oklahoma's great improvement in its law enforcement ranks in the face of the violent menace of what law, one lawman called a more brutal force than the traditional mafia itself. Well, as the 1960s transitioned into the 1970s, however, a blazing attack on eastern Oklahoma specifically commenced. It began with a series of nightclub bombings, then assistant County District Attorney Bill Bliss boldly confronted the mounting crime wave. His wife Joyce recalled Bill was raiding and closing up the clubs they were running illegally. Then Bliss himself was car bombed, the Assistant District Attorney of Cherokee County, in his Tahlequah driveway. The explosion laid open his intestines and injured one of his small children. OSBI legend and former director Dick Wilkerson recalled that whether or not the Dixie Mafia ordered the Bill Bliss attack, they almost certainly executed it as bombers for hire, as temp workers. Bliss later testified, he did survive, barely, that though infamous Oklahoma, C Oklahoma Dixie Mafia Confederate Rex Brindley Jr. denied involvement in the bombing, he brazenly, Br Brindley that is, told the prosecutor to his face that he knew who did it. Well, prior to the attack, the strapping Bliss had physically thrown the muscular Brindley out of his house and throttled him when the latter stormed in on the Bliss family as they ate dinner. But Brindley went free while Bliss continued to serve his community, his face permanently disfigured from the blast. Crusading Tahlequah pictorial press publisher Ted Reisenhoover, meanwhile, saw the crime scourge descending on northeast Oklahoma like a locust plague and he used his newspaper as a bully pulpit to crusade against it. An ominous telephone threat failed to back him off. Then one night, Reisenhoover's empty newspaper office was bombed. Yet another car bomb nearly killed District Judge Fred Nelson as he started his station wagon in the driveway of his fashionable Tulsa home. Tom Lester Pugh and Al McDonald, two of the most infamous Dixie Mafia desperados, were charged in Judge Nelson's attack. They escaped conviction primarily because they murdered two of their own colleagues, one of whom intended to testify to their guilt and one who already had. The latter victim was Cleo Epps, 
mythical queen of the bootleggers from the bygone days of Prohibition. She had supplied Pugh and McDonald with the explosives they used against Judge Nelson, though she didn't know their intentions. Epps, though, decided to end her criminal career. She testified against Pugh and McDonald upon learning of the most appalling crime the Dixie Mafia ever executed and one of the most horrible murders in Oklahoma history. Furnished by prosecutors with a disguise for protection in the courtroom, she indicated Pugh's and McDonald's likely guilt to a grand jury. She was later found stuffed in a Tulsa septic tank with two bullets in her head. Well, the atrocity that had turned even the hard-bitten Cleo Epps unleashed the hounds of hell and justice alike on the Dixie Mafia in Oklahoma and changed the history of the state. It occurred the frigid morning of February 2, 1971, in a modest Bristow neighborhood. There, kindly 28-year-old kindergarten teacher Fern Bolding walked out to her driveway to start her husband Don's pickup so it could warm up before she drove herself and her five-year-old daughter Kim to school. Don was driving Fern's more gas-efficient economy car to his job in Stroud. As her little girl watched TV inside the house, Fern started the truck. It exploded into a hurricane of fire and metal that ravaged entire sections of the neighborhood and set other parts of it on fire. One lawman said the explosion could have destroyed four trucks. Following her brutal murder, one of her five-year-old students asked another, Where is Miss Bolding? She's in heaven, the other boy answered. I hope he comes back, the first boy said. I like her. Well, suspected from the start in this mournful atrocity was shady Tahlequah restaurateur and nightclub owner Rex Brindley Jr. He possessed an arrest resume stretching back to the early 60s. Highway Patrol Lieutenant Don Mincer had recently arrested Brindley for stealing a truck in Tulsa. Don Bolding was slated to testify against him three days after his wife's death. Bombings continued to abound in eastern Oklahoma, many of them against nightclubs who refused to carry a particular Muskogee vending company's machines. Others targeted the businesses of Muskogee City Council members. An FBI study confirmed the public's sense of a gathering volcano of violence centered in eastern and particularly northeastern Oklahoma. State crime had multiplied six times faster in the 1960s than the population had. Fatefully, the area's widespread tolerance of bootlegged liquor during Prohibition days had spawned an immoral undercurrent in Northeast Oklahoma throughout the society. It included both apathy and fear on the part of many lawmen. Now it exploded into bloodshed. There was something else, too. Acclaimed Oklahoman historian Bob Burke later chronicled it in his powerful biography of Attorney General Larry Derryberry of Altus, Derryberry had been in office less than 30 days when Fern Bolding was savagely murdered. He decried a sweeping series of so-called progressive legal decisions by the United States Supreme Court. These rulings had crippled the efforts of law enforcement to win convictions against the Brindleys, McDonald's, and Pews of the world. They diminished the scope of grand jury investigations, encouraged the most important witnesses not to testify, and often outlawed the granting of immunity to other important witnesses. They also prevented grand juries from exerting authority beyond the one county where they were impaneled, even though crimes often involved multiple counties. Well, as Oklahoma reeled from this onslaught of blood and terror, Governor David Hall formed a state task force on crime with Attorney General Derry Berry as chairman. Derry Berry built the most comprehensive alliance of law enforcement organizations in Oklahoma history. Local, state, and federal agencies alike pooled their manpower and resources. Oklahoma was going to war with the Dixie Mafia. War with the Dixie Mafia? I can hardly wait to hear this. This is Oklahoma Gold. Stitching the past to the present. Dixie Mafia, and we brought them to justice. John J. Dwyer, how did that happen? Well, the A-team that Attorney General Larry Derryberry fielded 
In the early 1970s, Gwen, as the tip of his law enforcement spear, included six foot four inch, 280 pound assistant AG Paul Bear Ferguson, crime busting Tulsa District Attorney Buddy Fallis, and former Marine Dick Wilkerson, who we've mentioned before in both programs on the Dixie Mafia. Also, Muskogee based ATF investigative agent Aaron Elliott, Army trained OSBI explosives expert Larry Casey, incorruptible state troopers Joe Cantrell and the aforementioned uh, Lieutenant Don Mincer, and OSBI chief agent and former Army intelligence officer Tom Puckett. And I mention these names because, and we talk about this in volume two of the Oklahomans, to whatever extent men can be described as being made of iron. Derry Berry and his immortals lived up to that name. They faced threats to their own lives and families, temptations, public attacks, even by friends, and countless opportunities to climb down from the desperate contest for Oklahoma to which they put their hand. Derry Berry himself was shot in the throat with a paintball like charge of red dye during a press conference. Psychopath Rex Brindley threatened Wilkerson's life to his face. Puckett escaped ousting from his OSBI role by a cabal of legislative leaders only through the gutsy efforts of a 29-year-old state senator from Tulsa named Frank Keating. Those leaders did not consider OKC native Puckett, who took shrapnel in the face as a United States Marine fighting the Japanese in World War II, as politically cooperative enough for their tastes. Well, Derry Berry's larger order of battle included his AG's office, the ATF, the OSBI, the Oklahoma Department of Public Safety, including the Highway Patrol, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Muskogee, and the State Fire Marshal's Office. As the bombings and body count in eastern Oklahoma continued to rise, the task force went to work. Casey began to unravel clues that unlocked the secret to the bombers' identities. Fallis and the others ground out the work of gathering evidence, finding and questioning witnesses, and cobbling together difficult cases. And then there was Wilkerson. In one riot, one ranger fashion, he lived and operated alone for a remote 8 by 33 foot trailer alongside the Illinois River. An elite force recon marine during the Vietnam War, Wilkerson was a one-man wrecking crew against the rampaging criminals. Unfazed by their brazen threats and actions, he shrewdly outthought them, he not only tracked down killer Al McDonald, the crazed murderer of Cleo Epps and others, including possibly Mrs. Buford Pusser. He also outdrew that gunman after McDonald ducked away into his bedroom and yanked open a chest drawer with both hands after Wilkerson had confronted him. I'll kill you if you come out of there with anything but a pair of socks, Wilkerson warned, aiming his 44 at McDonald. Uh, no, I'm just getting some socks, McDonald said, backing away from the drawer where Wilkerson found two loaded 38 caliber pistols. I should have killed him right then, Wilkerson told me years later. Wilkerson also brought Tom Lester Pugh back from an Arizona prison in chains by himself to stand trial for murdering a Dixie Mafia outlaw who was about to testify against McDonald. Wilkerson indulged the arrogant, profane Pugh's verbal ramblings while craftily gleaming information about various unsolved cases from the killer's own mouth. Wilkerson also nabbed the rampaging bomber Johnny English. Historian Bob Burke well described the mounting drama. Lawmen knew winning the case against Brindley, Burke wrote, would go a long way in convincing less desperate criminals in Northeast Oklahoma that bombings and killings would not be tolerated. Agents Wilkerson, Puckett, and Elliott met with Derry Berry and his assistants every night, planning strategy for the next day's court session. The agents and Trooper Cantrell knew Brindley well and worked with Derryberry to get inside the criminal's head. In the end, as Derryberry himself said, the best witness against Rex Brindley Jr. was Brindley himself. He talked himself into prison, Derryberry said. Fourteen different witnesses, including Wilkerson, Elliott, several other lawmen, and Judge Bill Bliss, the former district attorney nearly killed in the likely Dixie Mafia-involved car bombing, all testified under oath that Brindley had bragged to them about killing or having Fern Bolding, the mother and teacher of five-year-old children, killed. Intrepid, hulking prosecutor Bear Ferguson climactically provoked Brindley into shouting that he claimed credit for staging the bombing. 
to get that bunch of idiot lawmen off me so I can get about my own business. The Golden Nugget Gwen, Larry Derryberry, and his Immortals, a name for which I give a tip of the hat to old Herodotus. They risked their lives against some of the most dangerous men ever to come out of Oklahoma. They did their job and they made the streets, the country roads, and even most of the nightclubs safe for all of us Oklahomans, most of whose names these valiant sentinels never even knew. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. <laughs>